Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, the Campaign for Women's Suffrage in Virginia. I'm Lorraine Moffa, Programming Coordinator for Loudoun County Public Library, and we're honored to bring you this program in collaboration with the Library of Virginia. Presenters Mary Julian and Brent Tarter are research historians at the Library of Virginia and editors of the Dictionary of Virginia Biography. They were curators of the We Demand exhibition at the Library of Virginia in 2020, which is currently being exhibited at Gum Spring Library until June 30th. The exhibit will then travel to Cascades Library, followed by Sterling Library. If you have any questions during the program, please type them in the chat box and I can relay them to Mary and Brent during or after the presentation. Please note too that this presentation is being recorded and can be viewed on Loudoun County Public Library's YouTube page in a week or two. So let's get started. Hi, Mary. Hi, Brent. Thanks for bringing us the story of this history of these great ladies. Well, thank you for inviting us. It's always nice to be able to visit a one of the Virginia County Library Systems, even if it's a long way from where I live near Richmond. This first slide is the 1919 version of a map that advocates of woman suffrage published throughout the 19 teens to demonstrate their success in gaining the vote for women. On this map, the states that are in white had woman suffrage. The states that are in black had no woman suffrage. The other states with dots or stars had woman suffrage in some elections and not in other elections. One of the interesting things about this map is that you see that for reasons that are still not entirely clear, woman suffrage made more headway in the Great Plains and in the West than it initially did in the East, either in the Northeast or in the Southeast. Woman suffrage was very controversial when it was first proposed back in the 19, 1850s and 60s, and then when it was again proposed at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, men, of course, had always dominated politics, government in, in the United States, white men. Politics and government were a white man's business. And you can see by this map that in some places, advocates of woman suffrage had easy success, and in other places, it was very difficult. It was difficult everywhere for some of the same reasons. Women were supposed to be the peculiar repositories of virtue and culture in the country. Women's, ladies, special responsibility was to raise good young citizens and good mothers. Women were not supposed to be involved in the dirty business of politics. The men were supposed to run the country and make the livings. But when people began advocating woman suffrage, they made some really good arguments against that proposition that government should be only for white men. Women said, we need the vote in order to look out after our own interests as wives and as mothers. Our children and our grandchildren and our families depend on good laws to regulate child labor, uh, public health, public safety. Women have an interest in this. Women need to have a voice in these issues. Also, if politics was a dirty thing, it was the men who made it dirty. And women's jobs have always been to clean up the messes that the men have made. Woman suffrage flew right in the face of very widespread and deeply held ideas about gender roles in American society that the men were the heads of the families, therefore the heads of the businesses, therefore the heads of the governments, that women were to play a subservient role and their responsibility was confined to the home and to the family and to the children. Proposing to let women vote or even run for office was a very revolutionary and unsettling thing for many people of this time. And in some parts of the country, it was almost impossible to convince enough male politicians of the value of woman suffrage, that they would amend state constitutions or amend state laws in order to allow women to vote. This was particularly the case in the American South, in the states of the former Confederacy. At the beginning of the 20th century, when the modern suffrage movement began to gain speed, that was exactly at the same time in which the states of the former Confederacy had been writing new laws and new state constitutions 
with the express purpose of disfranchising black men. Black men won the vote in the 1860s after the Civil War when Congress authorized the uh, submission of the 15th Amendment of the Constitution to ratification and also required states of the former Confederacy to write new state constitutions and grant black men the right to vote in order that black people could be full American citizens, freed from slavery and admitted to full citizenship. But in the 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century, white supremacy politicians in many places in the country, but especially in the states of the former Confederacy, contrived an end run around the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment, you may re recall, prohibited states from denying the vote to any person, to any man, on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Well, what people in southern states did was divide, deny the vote to black men if they were unable to pay a poll tax, if they were unable to read and write, if they were poor, if they could not find means or to uh, comply with complex voter registration procedures. Those were not reasons of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So they got around that. Now, if you're proposing woman suffrage at the very same time that Southern white politicians were succeeding in driving black men out of politics, you were proposing something that those men were not prepared for. Those men were not prepared to have the federal government or the federal constitution gain an ability to meddle in state government, state laws that controlled votes. Because at this time, except for the 15th Amendment, every election law in the country was a state or local law. State and local people decide who could vote, how they could vote, under what circumstances they could vote, and who they could vote for. Proposals of woman suffrage encountered opposition everywhere. But there were also advocates of woman suffrage everywhere. The next slide is going to show Lila B. Valentine of Richmond. That's her on the left. She was one of 20 women, all from Richmond, all prosperous, prosperous upper class white ladies of Richmond, who founded the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia in November 1909. Their stated purpose was to secure the votes for women on equal terms with men. This was a revolutionary proposition in the American South, especially in Virginia. These women were proposing something that most men were totally unprepared to accept. These women were dedicated to their objective. They were hardworking. They were smart. They were imaginative. They persisted in spite of many, many kinds of opposition. Sometimes in public speeches, people threw pepper in the face of suffrage speakers. They threw rocks at them. They shouted at them. They insulted them for doing something that was unladylike. Of course, all those objective means were ungentlemanly-like. But the women persisted. They organized all over the state. And in the course of 20 years, they increased the number of Equal Suffrage League of Virginia members from 20 to 20,000. By 1919, the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia was almost certainly the largest organization of Virginians in history, except in an army. And it was the women who did it. It was these white women who did it. And they found they created leagues throughout the state, more than 140 of them, we know for sure, and probably more than that. They organized, you know, what they do, relatives in other towns and counties. Uh, they knew people through their church work. Uh, most of these women who were interested in suffrage had been involved already in advocating public policy issues of importance to women, child labor laws, laws limiting the number of hours women could be forced to work each week to only 10, six days a week. They wanted to improve public education, public health, public safety. And so they had already met many women around the state. This was also the time at which Virginia women, like American women elsewhere, were creating women's clubs throughout the towns and cities. These offered them easy networks to spread the word and to assist each other in creating local and county and city leagues to promote woman suffrage. They spoke on courthouse steps during court day. They spoke at county and state fairs. This other picture that you're seeing 
is one of the early Equal Suffrage League of Virginia booths at a state fair in about 1912 or 13. They were a remarkable group of people. Um, while we were working on researching the Equal Suffrage League, we met people that were truly amazing that we'd never heard of. We thought we knew something about this period. But we went through the Equal Suffrage League surviving records, which are in the Library of Virginia in Richmond. And the uh, papers of Richmond artist Adele Clark, which are right down the street in the Library of Virginia Commonwealth University. And those allowed us to identify many, many local and regional leaders who were extraordinary people. Their names had never appeared in a history book before. And it's a great plea. Those people ought to be role models. They ought to be heroes. They need to be classed right alongside the heroes of the American Revolution and the American Civil Rights Movement for fighting an uphill battle to extend democracy in Virginia. Uh, these people are amazing. Uh, we, we, we write about them in our book. Uh, we have uh, little character sketches and photographs of many of them in the traveling exhibition. And they were truly an inspiration because they were doing something nobody thought was possible. Nobody, well, they thought it was possible, but nobody else thought it was possible that a group of women could persuade Virginia politicians, all of whom were white, to propose woman suffrage. What they proposed was an amendment to the state constitution to grant women the right to vote. In the beginning, as I mentioned, all of the uh, election laws in the country were state and local laws. So the woman suffrage movement began as a series of state movements. Every state had one. And in Virginia, the Equal Suffrage League um, was the first one that mattered. Founded in 1909, it rapidly grew and engaged the work of some of the most remarkable uh, progressive women in Virginia at that time. They, they almost succeeded. They almost succeeded because they didn't succeed in getting an amendment to the state constitution and because they ne did not persuade the General Assembly to ratify the 19th Amendment in 1920, we have always thought that they failed. We always viewed the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia and the other women suffragists as fighting a losing campaign, yet another progressive losing campaign that the white conservative Democratic men in the state nearly always blocked. However, we learned that that's not quite correct. In fact, they very nearly did achieve their objective of getting a state constitutional convention. And I will let Mary tell you how they went about beginning that important work. All righty. So yes, as Brent mentioned, the Equal Suffrage League had more than 140 local leagues from the Eastern Shore to Big Stone Gap. And they were intended to educate women and men about the importance of women's voting rights, as well as to pressure the state legislators to approve a woman's suffrage amendment. Um, and the General Assembly or the House of Delegates in the General Assembly did vote on a state amendment um, three times and did not pass. But it, that was not the end of the story. Um, it is important to note, I think Brent also mentioned this, that the Equal Suffrage League was an organization for white women and men who could also join. Although black women in Virginia definitely supported votes for women. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But league officers would travel around the state giving speeches and helping local communities organize. In September, 1914, Lila Mead Valentine spoke in Leesburg to an overflowing crowd at the courthouse. About 50 women then organized a local league with Jane Young Powell as its first president. And a year later, Valentine toured the area again, speaking and organizing chapters in Waterford and Purcellville. And in Middleburg, Charlotte Noland, who had recently founded Foxcroft School for Girls, introduced Valentine to the crowd, and she became chairman of the Middleburg Equal Suffrage League when it was organized. Now, we don't know a lot about the um, specific activities of the leagues in Loudoun County, although there might be articles in local newspapers or in records of the local women's clubs in the area that could provide details about their work. And women like Jane Powell and Charlotte Noland who headed up these leagues <clears throat> and advocated for their voting rights were definitely stepping outside the boundaries of acceptable behavior for women. Fanny Bailey King, who was president of the league in Stanton, <clears throat> excuse me, 
She later recalled that after she gave a suffrage speech to the Working Men's Fraternal Association there, that, quote, my male relatives and friends crossed the street or dodged into stores to keep from speaking to such a bold, bad woman. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how did suffragists get their message out to the public at a time when there's no television or social media? They held parlor meetings and teas. They gave speeches on courthouse steps, churches, on the streets in front of busy department stores. They visited their legislators. They wrote letters to the editor. They had booths at local fairs where they passed out literature and asked people to sign petitions in favor of women suffrage. The Equal Suffrage League members regularly staffed the booth at the state fair, like we saw in the earlier picture. And in 1915, a local newspaper remarked that, quote, the words suffragist and fair are becoming almost synonymous terms. For no fair will be held in Virginia this fall, unornamented by the floating yellow banners of the suffrage cause. The women organized rallies on National Suffrage Day, and you can see one on the um, steps of the state capitol in May 1915 and the picture on the left. And suffragists would speak anywhere they could find a crowd. Artist Adele Clark would set up her easel on street corners and start painting to attract an audience before launching into her suffrage speech. And later in her life, she said, quote, it reached the point where I couldn't see a fire plug without beginning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, another public way to attract attention was participating in parades. And local communities would have lots of um, parades throughout the year, patriotic parades, Labor Day parades, fire department parades. Um, and the suffragists would decorate a car with banners and placards. They would wear their votes for women sashes and they would join the parades. In 1913, about 100 Virginia women marched in the National Suffrage Parade organized in Washington, D.C. And you can see um, a photo from that parade in the on the right. And it was held the day before Woodrow Wilson's presidential inauguration. So there was a crowd of hundreds of thousands of people there to see it and thousands of women participated. Some of the men tried to break up the parade, although the women were eventually able to complete their route down Pennsylvania Avenue. And Faith Morgan, who was a suffragist from Hampton, described how the, men's, the men spit near their skirts and tried to trip them up. So she responded by stepping on the foot of the man closest to her. She wrote that she could, quote, hear a plaintive voice behind me bleeding. She stepped on my foot. She stepped on my foot. The glow of my satisfaction is ever burning. So these large public spectacles contributed to some dissent in the suffrage movement, however. And just a few weeks after that 1915 rally at the state capitol, a group of women broke with the Equal Suffrage League, and they formed the Virginia branch of the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. Now, this was a national organization that had been founded by Alice Paul in 1913, and the Congressional Union's focus was on passing an amendment to the United States Constitution, which would grant women across the country the right to vote. Sophie Meredith, who you see on the right, was chair of the Virginia branch, and she had been a founding member of the Equal Suffrage League, but she realized that this strategy of changing election laws in each state or in each state constitution would just take too long, and it was too uneven in its results. Now, when we started this project a few years ago, we didn't know a whole lot about the Congressional Union um, uh, Virginia branch. But thanks to the generosity of Sophie Meredith's great granddaughter, the library now has the minute book for the group. So we learned a lot more about the work of these women. And now the Congressional Union was renamed the National Women's Party in 1917, and it still exists today. And it focused its attention on congressmen in Washington, D.C., and they were much more confrontational in their tactics than the Equal Suffrage League. Now, the Virginia branch was a very small group. It had um, about five to 600 members in contrast to the Equal Suffrage League, which had thousands. And um, there was a very small group of four National Women's Party members in Luckett's and Loudoun County, um, which had been organized by Emma Johnson Willard. Although we really don't know uh, anything about what this group of women did in particular. 
But the Virginia members of the National Women's Party did make their presence known. They held well-publicized meetings with members of Congress, and they took part in events like marching to the U.S. Capitol to deliver petitions containing thousands of signatures collected around the country in favor of women's voting rights. And beginning in 1917, Virginia women also participated in picketing at the White House. Now, this was a radical move that was intended to force President Woodrow Wilson to endorse a federal suffrage amendment. Now, it's common to see protesters at the White House today, but suffragists were the first group to embrace this as a strategy. The women stood silently with banners along the White House fence, but they were often harassed, and hundreds of them were arrested by police for, quote, obstructing traffic. Some women would pay their fines. Sophie Meredith was in her 60s when she was arrested, and her children told her to um, pay her fine because they thought it was better to be a live suffragist than a dead one. But many other suffragists went to prison where they endured dirty uniforms, unsanitary conditions, and inedible food. Pauline Adams, who you see on the right in this screen, um, had been a founding member of the Norfolk Equal Suffrage League chapter before joining the National Women's Party. And she wrote to her family from the workhouse in Occoquan, where she was serving a 60-day sentence. I have been kept from the privilege of incoming or outgoing mail for over the past week and am now locked in a small cell in solitary. I have not been given my toothbrush or hairbrush here yet, but I got the loan of this pencil from a new picket who came in with another group yesterday. These street conflicts between the peaceful suffragists and their opponents and the police attracted national attention. Reports of respectable women being arrested and going to jail helped keep the issue of women's suffrage at the forefront of people's minds. And former prisoners like Pauline Adams and others publicly described their physical abuse while in prison. Some of them were even force-fed when they went on hunger strikes. And all of this served to attract sympathy for the cause. Now, not all suffragists approved of such publicity Equal Suffrage League President Lila Mead Valentine condemned the, quote, folly of these fanatical women because she feared that such behavior harmed the suffrage cause in Virginia. And virtually all of the pickets at the White House were white women, although um, Mary Church Terrell, who was a, an African-American woman, civil rights activist and vocal supporter of women's voting rights, did participate. So although the Equal Suffrage League and the Virginia branch of the National Women's Party disagreed about how to achieve voting rights for women, both of the groups did agree that Black women would not be members. Virginia's long history of racial discrimination and segregation meant that African-American women were kept out of the fight for women's suffrage in Virginia. But that doesn't mean that they weren't involved at all. Richmond civil rights activist Maggie Walker, who was the first African-American woman to be president of a bank, kept the issue of voting rights before the readers of her organization's newspaper, the St. Luke Herald. Lynchburg native Jimmy Bug was a student at Howard University at the time of the National Suffrage Parade in 1913, and she urged members of Delta Sigma Theta, the sorority that she had helped organize at Howard, to take part in the parade, even though they had to march separately from the white students after white Southern suffragists had complained about Black women participating. So many African-American women, just like white women, advocated progressive era reforms to public education, public health, and labor laws, and they also advocated suffrage as a way to accomplish these legislative reforms. Hampton social worker Janie Porter Barrett, who was later superintendent of a school for at-risk girls, supported votes for women, and after ratification, she would remind her students that voting was a duty they must take seriously. Janie Barrett was the founding president of the Virginia State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, and in 1912, she and about 70 Virginia women attended the convention of the National Association of Colored Women that met at Hampton Institute that year. They undoubtedly attended the convention's roundtable on women's suffrage, and they likely supported the convention's resolution in favor of women's voting rights. And members of women's clubs in Hampton and Norfolk also staged a suffrage parade as part of the convention festivities. Maggie Walker spoke at the convention about the struggles of Black working women. Capital at once took advantage of women's necessity by compelling her to do a man's work at a smaller wage. Of course, the women rebelled and are rebelling and rebellion even 
at this present moment, yet capital is deaf and will never hear their cries until women force capital to hear them at the ballot box. Having experienced the changes that happened in state and local government when Black men gained the vote after the Civil War, Black women understood the importance of having the ballot to bringing about social, economic, and political change. And a lack of sources has been one of the biggest ob obstacles in documenting the activity of Black women in Virginia. Like Brent said, we do have a lot of records for the white women's groups, but far fewer for organizations of Black women from this time period. So we hope that interest in the ratification centennial and ongoing interest in voting rights inspires people to help turn up new stories. And if you ever find you know, letters, organization records, stash of old newspapers, uh, the Library of Virginia would also love to hear about it. Now the issue of race also played a significant role in the anti-suffrage efforts in Virginia, which Brent will talk about. As I think I mentioned at the beginning, suffragists in Virginia and elsewhere faced an enormous number of different kinds of barriers. Race was the biggest one. White men in the South were in the concluding their attempts to drive black men out of politics and secure white supremacy. But if someone wants to knock a hole in the white supremacy wall, opponents of a uh, woman suffrage would argue, one of the ways to do it is to let black women vote. We were very excited when we were reading the letters and newspaper stories about these white Virginia women because they were amazing people. We wondered where were the black women? They were there, they were behind the scenes, and they were also the objects of some extraordinarily nasty propaganda. Opponents of woman suffrage were blatant in their ferocious racism. Look at these excerpts the one from, from uh, white supremacy newspapers. Um, it's almost like reading some of the 1970s and early 21st century propaganda against women's rights and the Equal Rights Amendment. There were threats. Look at this, 29 counties would go under Negro rule, over 60 counties in the state of Georgia, the entire state of Mississippi. Well, that's a gross exaggeration. That just suggests that there were large numbers of black people in Virginia who could not vote and they might become voters if woman suffrage weakened the white supremacy provisions of the state's constitution that had been put into effect in 1902. Anti-suffrage arguments uh, were oftentimes rooted in race, and many of the leading suffragists were themselves strong advocates of white supremacy. They tried to mute the problems that they said woman suffrage would create. Lila Mead Valentine and other members of the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia would remind white men that white men had already placed very high barriers in the way of black men registering to vote, and that those barriers would still stand and prevent very many black women from voting. So according to the advocates of woman suffrage in Virginia, extending the vote to women would not really threaten white supremacy. It would in fact bolster white supremacy because more white women would be able to register to vote than black women. There are many other kinds of arguments against woman suffrage. If you uh, break down the family, was, that's what they said it would happen. Woman suffrage would break down the family. It would ruin the family life. Um, it would destroy the institution of marriage and destroy all the institutions of morality. Um, and it wouldn't make a difference. They said, woman suffrage is not going to improve schools. It's not going to reduce crime. It's not going to close saloons. It's not going to close brothels. Well, you know, in one respect, those are true. But on the other hand, if women were involved in the morality issues in politics, they did have a chance of making men change their minds, which is what the woman suffrage movement wanted to do. Now, of course, we must realize that not all suffragists agreed 
Not all anti-suffragists agreed, and not all women agreed with one another either. In fact, most of the main leaders of the opposition to woman suffrage in Virginia in the beginning were women. They even organized an anti-suffrage organization with women officers. It's curious to me to notice that the uh, Virginia, uh, what was it called, the Virginia Association Opposed to Woman Suffrage had women officers, but it also had a large group of male advisors. They're listed by name on the letterhead of the uh, association's uh, records. Equal Suffrage League did not have men listed as officers, although men did join and men did take part, but the um, Equal Suffrage League advocates of open suffrage was all led by women. Look at some of the arguments that you see on the little uh, handout on the right side. Facts show indubitably that suffrage has done nothing that its advocates claim for in the states and counties where women have the ballot. The best legislative uh, legislation affecting women and children is in states where women do not have the ballot. Well, that's not true. Women cannot have the franchise without going into politics. And political women will be a minister to society, into the home, into the state. Well, that's ridiculous. Equal franchise will only double existing conditions in the electorate if all women vote and if all double alleged expenses. Men can, more can be done for advancement of higher interests of the race by the influence of women. I mean, this is just like reading opposition a few years ago to the Equal Suffrage League. This is uh, falsehoods. It's misleading. It's half truth. It's scare tactics. And it attracted a lot of attention. The advocates of woman suffrage had many obstacles to face, and the opponents of woman suffrage reacted with many uh, almost unanswerable charges because they're not based on fact. It's interesting to me, too, that uh, many of the opponents of woman suffrage were themselves women who were engaged in some of the same social improvement organizations of the progressive period that the leading suffragists embraced. They proposed improvement of public schools for white children. They proposed, they proposed increased, increased public health. But they were unable to get beyond the traditional gender roles in society that they had all grown up with in the decades after the Civil War. And race played a large part of that. They were afraid. In fact, there was one Virginia suffragist who made a speech saying that just because we all carried pistols after Civil War to protect ourselves, now we need the vote to protect ourselves. In spite of all of this extreme opposition, the suffragists in Virginia very nearly succeeded. I think I said this earlier. In 1919, Advocates of a national constitutional amendment succeeded by getting Congress to propose the 19th Amendment for ratification. This was in June of 1919. Now, you may remember from your civics class that it requires a, a positive vote in three quarters of all of the state's legislatures for an amendment to the Constitution to be ratified, which meant that in 1919, the uh, attention of the country shifted away from Congress and back to the state legislatures. These cards here were compiled by officers and volunteers of the Equal Suffrage League in 1919. They compiled a card like this for every member of the House of Delegates, and they compiled cards like this for members of the Senate of Virginia, and, and recorded on those how Virginia legislators had voted if they had a chance to vote on suffrage earlier in the decade. They um, made notes about interviews that they had with members of the General Assembly to ascertain what their opinions were. Um, this is a pretty sophisticated innovation in American, or at least in Virginia, lobbying. We know very little uh, about uh, how groups of people lobbied the General Assembly uh, before the 19-teens, 
What we do know suggests that the main way was for corporate lawyers, railroad lawyers, bankers, and people to bribe legislators with money or alcohol or women. The Equal Suffrage League officers used persuasion. They used persuasion. They petitioned the General Assembly. They got local leaders to approach members of the General Assembly and talk about um, woman suffrage to persuade them that their constituents believed in woman suffrage. The uh, card on the left is for B.F. Nolan, who was a member of the House of Delegates from Loudoun County. You see, they misspelled Loudoun, as people frequently do and did. At Nolan, Benjamin Franklin Nolan, nice patriotic name. Nolan um, came around to the support the suffrage cause very early. He voted for it in the General Assembly in 1914 and 1916. Um, he opposed an anti-suffrage resolution in 1919. And if you will look at the line of type of handwritten notes that goes right beneath his face, you can see boasts of his continuous support of suffrage. He voted for the uh, 19th Amendment in 1920. And there was another delegate from up there. At that time, um, the voters of Loudoun County elected a member of the House of Delegates. Voters in the neighboring county of Fauquier elected a member of the House of Delegates. And members of both counties together elected a third. It was called a Floterio district. We no longer use those. But the member who had that other district was Wilbur Hall, also from Leesburg, who is recorded on his card as expressing the hope that woman suffrage would be adopted, but that he wanted conspicuous pressure brought on him so that he could say he had to do it. So he would not seriously displease his constituents who were still opposed to woman suffrage. The card on the right I find particularly interesting, Richard Lewis Brewer of Suffolk. Brewer was one of the most influential members of the House of Delegates in 1919. And in fact, everybody knew by the autumn of 1919 that he was going to become the Speaker of the House of Delegates in January of 1920. Suffragists interviewed him frequently. Richmond artist Adele Clark talked to him at great length late in 1919. And they actually planned legislative strategy. Brewer had become persuaded that woman suffrage was a good thing. And he advised the Equal Suffrage League that it would be better to have the, um, the, the resolution ratifying the 19th Amendment introduced in the House of Delegates first. And that might make it easier for it to pass the Senate. He also suggested to Adele Clark, that it would be easier still to propose an amendment to the state constitution. Well, I mean, the Equal Suffrage League had given up on that when it, the, she, the scene of action shifted to Congress and the 19th Amendment. But, you know, Brewer was right, because the General Assembly in 1920 did some things that we didn't know about. We knew that in 1920, both houses of the General Assembly, by large margins, rejected the 19th Amendment. But that's not all they did. They also passed, by a pretty considerable margin, a law that uh, the suffragists called the Machinery Bill. This bill provided that if the constitutional amendment passed and woman suffrage became legal throughout the United States, then Adult Virginia women could pay their poll tax and register and vote the same as new white men were able to pay their poll tax and register and vote. But that that law would not go into effect unless the 19th Amendment were ratified. And then the General Assembly did the most remarkable thing. Both houses of the General Assembly, by a very large margin, proposed a woman suffrage amendment to the state constitution. Now, amending the state constitution is a protracted three-step process that in those days usually took about three years. 
it was too late to matter because the 19th Amendment was ratified in August of 1920, long before the legislators could take the second step. But what, what this indicates to us is that the women who had been advocating woman suffrage for an entire year had, in fact, persuaded a large majority of the leading politicians of Virginia to support woman suffrage. This was not a failure. This was a success that came just a little bit too late to matter. So when we found that out, we suddenly began looking at all of our records again, not for evidence of how and why they couldn't succeed, but looking at their organization and their campaign and their persuasion to ascertain why they did come so close to achieving their original objective. This is a remarkable success story, even though it has been hidden and nobody even knew it. Remarkable thing. So when the 19th Amendment was ratified in, in um, August of 1920, registrars in Virginia opened their booths. County and local treasurers started collecting poll taxes and women rushed in to register to vote for the very first time in the state. Yes, they definitely did rush in to vote, some even before the uh, the registrar offices were officially open to them. Now, 100 years ago, voter registration was a much more complex process uh, than it is today. So like we talked about a little bit, first a woman had to go pay her poll tax, um, which had become part of the state constitution in 1902 to limit voting by Black men. And the women were able to register as new voters, so they only had to pay $1.50 um, for 1920 instead of having to be paid up for three years, which is what the law normally required. And even though $1.50 or 450 for the three years may not sound like a whole lot of money, when many people earned um, far less than $100 a month, which was the case 100 years ago, that amount was not insignificant. So a prospective voter had to pay her poll tax at the treasurer's office. Then she would take her receipt to the local registrar's office. And some registrars would um, have evening hours for women. Others might only be open a couple days a week, though. And more than one registrar in Virginia resigned rather than register women to vote. So once at the registrar's office, each woman had to provide her name, age, occupation, address, and length of residence. And you can see um, a registration book pictured on the screen here with Maggie Walker's registration. And registrars would sometimes help the white women by providing a sheet of paper that outlined all of this requested information, but Black women would not receive such prompts. And if a woman couldn't provide the details from memory, the registrar could turn her away and disqualify her and the poll tax was not refunded. Registrars could also ask any question they wanted to determine someone's eligibility to vote, which they often did to disqualify uh, African-American voters. Questions like how many people does it take to make a county? Or how long can the House of Representatives take recess without consent of the Senate? And if you didn't know the answers, again, you would be disqualified and out your $1.50 poll tax. And sometimes, uh, registrars would make sure to register all the white women before they would register the black women and keep them waiting. But this complicated process is why white and black women organized meetings all over the state to prepare for registration. Now, Richmond was one of the localities that had a fairly high percentage of women who registered. More than 10,000 white women did with the help of Equal Suffrage League members who were deputized as assistant registrar. Richmond banker Maggie Walker and social worker Ora Brown Stokes organized a voter registration drive that helped um, 2,400 Black women register, although they also requested to work as assistant registrars but were turned down. Between 75,000 and 100,000 Virginia women registered to vote in the four week period after ratification. Now, this was less than 15% of the eligible population, but it was still a pretty remarkable accomplishment in a state that discouraged voter participation with poll taxes and literacy tests. There's no precise data on how many women registered in 1920, so our picture is incomplete, but we do know that women in urban areas generally registered at higher rates than in rural areas, and everywhere, white women always outnumbered Black women. I couldn't get... Um, 
numbers on how many women registered in Loudoun in 1920, but there was a report in 1921 that listed 700 and white women, 701 white women who registered, um, which was about 15% of the eligible population, and 42 black women, which was about three and a half percent of the eligible population who had registered who were registered to vote in 1921. After registering, one woman in Norfolk described the wonderful feeling of being a full-fledged voter. It gave her a sense of power to be really and truly a citizen of the United States of America and not just a make-believe. Now, presumably she was one of the approximately 77,000 women who voted in Virginia for the first time on election day in 1920. And I haven't seen any reports uh, about women voting in Loudoun County, but many newspapers across the state reported that women voted like they had been doing it all their lives. So the centennial of the 19th Amendment has been an important reminder of the struggles that Americans have overcome to gain their voting rights. And as Brent has mentioned, it's a good time to remember these remarkable women who helped expand democracy in Virginia and across the nation. Now, the fight did continue for many Virginians, as Roxy Martin wrote in her 1915 letter to the editor in the Clinch Valley News out in um, Tazewell County in southwest Virginia, quote, woman's suffrage is just one step onward in our march toward the really, truly democratic America. American Indians were not able to vote in 1920. They were not granted citizenship until 1924. And poll taxes and literacy tests continued to limit voting in all parts of the United States um, for decades until the 24th Amendment was ratified in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. And still today, we've seen in recent years, some people struggle to freely exercise their right to vote. So don't take it for granted. I always like to say that voting is your superpower, so make sure that you use it. Now we have a lot of resources about the suffrage campaign in Virginia online at the library's website, which is on the screen, um, edu.lva.virginia.gov slash we demand. We have a timeline, links to biographies of many of these women and some videos from our gallery exhibition in 2020. And the schedule for our traveling exhibition is also on the website. And I hope you um, are able to visit it at one of the Loudon branches while it is here. And if you want to learn, oops, even more, um, our book, The Campaign for Women's Suffrage in Virginia, is also available to order online. So thank you for joining us, and we will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Mary and Brent. That really was fascinating. Um, and please do know that in addition to reaching out to uh, the Library of Virginia to get more information. You can also stop into any of the Loudoun County Public Libraries and speak to your librarian and uh, she can uh, show you some databases and uh, books that you might be interested in to learn more. And um, yeah, I wonder how many people have, you know, information in their own homes or family records that can add to this story. So um, if that's the case, please do reach out to Mary or Brent. Definitely. We have definitely found as we've, um, you know, kind of look with the book as, you know, a look at more of the statewide campaign. But, you know, as we have looked in different localities, we always find new and fascinating stories, especially in newspapers, which having them online um, are so many newspapers available online in recent years. Mm -hmm made it possible to find out a lot of, you know, what's what people are doing in local communities. Yeah. We know more now than we did when we started, but there's still a large field of research that needs to be done in the localities. In the, every one of the Virginia counties and every one of the Virginia towns and cities had uh, a suffrage organization. And if people will get in there and look and um, find out who the, the organizers were, um, then you can unravel social networks and political networks and find out who else was involved in, in the local organization. Uh, we know of, we have good records for Richmond and Norfolk and pretty good records for Lynchburg and some good records for Rono. But many of the other places, we don't have that kind of information yet. But I'm convinced that for many places, that information can be discovered 
and it's going to be in your library in your local newspaper and um if the small collections of family records here and there or of women's clubs or of social service organizations um, those can provide really valuable clues in learning what people were doing in their communities on this important issue thank you brent any questions about the program today? And please be reminded that if you wanna take a look at it again or recommend it to a family member or friend, it will be on the Loudoun County Public Library YouTube page in, in a week or two, most likely a week. <laughs> Any questions, any comments? It doesn't have to be a comment. You could draw a parallel between this and some other important political issue. You could One of the things that was interesting groups. is how they, the arguments against suffrage, you see them over and over again, like Brent said, against the Equal Rights Amendment you know, in the 1970s, a lot of the same points come up again. So there is a question. Do you see the question by um, Pam? Let's see. The Virginia Suffragists Network with other states that had passed right to vote. For example, um, about they did, strategy. Yes, <laughs> they did do some of that. Um, and Lila Mean Valentine, actually, she went around a lot of states on the East Coast. She spoke in like North Carolina, South Carolina, West Virginia, New Jersey. She um she was you know, pretty sought after to help, you know, to make speeches and to help um, organize in some other states as well. Suffragists organized um, in their states and localities, but there were also national suffrage organizations that served as uh, organizational umbrellas. Um, as Mary said, uh, Lila Mead Valentine spoke in half a dozen states. Um, a young Quaker school teacher from Clark County, Mary Elizabeth Pigeon, worked for the suffragists first in New York and then in South Dakota, and then in Virginia and North Carolina. And she conducted many of the interviews and made many of the notes on those index cards of legislators that we saw. So this was done with uh, a network of national and local and state support and lots of coordination and sharing of resources. And, uh, the, you know, here are my good persuasive arguments. Try them out in your state. Fantastic. Yeah, it was a pretty well organized movement overall. You know, among national uh, lobbying organizations, it was really a pioneer, both in its size and its technique, and its organizing from the local level up to the national level. Uh, these are tactics that we see all the time now, but they were very innovative then. This was more than a hundred years the ago. Same, when the, yeah. technolo you know, the technology did not allow them many of the opportunities that we now take for granted. Mary and Brent, what's next for you? Are you digging into this subject more and staying with this? Or um, are you taking the history further along the line or... Um, looking into another topic as historians for the Library of Virginia. Oh my goodness, there are so many things that we need to know more about. And that oh would be yeah, really fascinating. Um, Mary and I and our colleague John Deal have been doing research on the experiences of Black Virginians in the decades after the end of slavery, and that subject has been just as interesting and and just as important as the work that we did earlier on woman suffrage. So um, there's no end of uh, investigations that we can make to throw light into some of the parts of our shared experience that we don't know as much about as we need to. Sure, and I, I'm sure there's some overlap too in all of the topics. Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah. Well, thank yeah, you. One of the interest, oh, I was gonna say one of the interesting things too has been looking at um, the early women who ran for office, you know, for the General Assembly in the House of Delegates, um, you know, right after the 19th Amendment was ratified, you know, they were getting ready to, to run. There weren't a whole lot, but there were more than we had, we had realized <laughs> were actually there. 
So yeah, that's another topic that would be something interesting for people to really dig into. Well, thank you for the good work you do. I mean, the overall story is fascinating, but then the personal stories of the people who are involved as well. So um, thank you so much for bringing us this today. And we hope you'll come back and talk to us about some other research you're doing or add to this story. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, and thank you for hosting the exhibition. We hope uh, lots of people will go and take a look at it if they haven't uh, already. I hope so. Thank you both, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.